Well, <laughs> I don't know about you, but it's essentially the, for some of us, it's the first week of this stay-at-home quarantine. For others of us, this is our second week being at home, kind of full-time now. And um, I'd ask the question of how are we doing? How are you holding up? Now, if I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, um, about noon on Monday, Courtney and I were having a conversation. Our boys were down for a nap. And I just asked her that question of like, hey, how are you holding up? She kind of was home last week. Um, in the week and like, this is her second week of kind of being home and working from home a little bit. And uh, I said, you know, how are you doing? How are you holding up? And, you know, she said, oh, you know, I'm doing good. I'm holding up all right. Things are kind of different. They're crazy. They look different. You know, and then she asked me, how are you doing? And it was noon on Monday, and I looked at her and I said, yeah, I'm over this. I'm going stir crazy. And this might be a few long weeks ahead of us. And so for me, this is, this is, this is tough to just be at home sometimes and to sit at home and to not be able to go out and to have social interaction. Um, I, I've been seeing some different videos or, or posts of, you know, hey, introverts, check on your extroverted friends because this is hard. Um, and, it, and it can be. But I'm often reminded too in these moments that maybe God just maybe is using this time for me to slow down a little bit, to pause, to take a moment to breathe him in and to breathe out all the things that I've been bogging myself down with, to breathe in his presence and breathe out the chaos, to breathe in his spirit and to breathe out the brokenness that we're feeling in this world, to breathe in his energy and his peace and breathe out the exhaustion, to take a moment, to remember that God is God and he's still on the throne. And even though we might feel so broken and bogged down today and maybe even defeated going through this, that God in all of this is still God and he's still victorious. And we can be hopeful. We can be hopeful that this too will pass. We can be hopeful that this right now is, is a season and we've talked about that. And hopeful that even in the midst of all of this, God is still working. He's still doing amazing things. And I believe that. I believe that we are on the cusp of seeing him after this season, after this storm of life, do incredible and amazing things. We're on the cusp, we're on the edge of seeing a breakthrough, seeing a revival. I believe this with everything inside me, that God is in the middle of all of this and he's doing great things and we are just about to see his spirit unleash. But first, we're just going to go through and weather this storm. Storms. I often remind myself that there's moments in, in my life that I've gone through a storm. It seems that life is either full of storms, valleys, or mountaintops. We use those analogies often. Sometimes you're on the mountaintop and everything's going really good, or sometimes you're in the valley and it just seems like everything is just blah. And then when we talk about storms, it's all these pivotal trials and troubles in our lives. It seems our life is riddled with those three kind of analogies, right? But, but these days truly feels like, at least for me, a storm that we're in the middle of and it's, and it's tough sometimes to be in the boat. And if we're honest, we've been through storms before. You've been through storms before. You've weathered them before. And you've seen them come and you've seen them go. And if we're going to be truthful and, and brutally honest with each other, sometimes they come out of nowhere. And sometimes they can leave just as, quick as quickly as they've come. In some storms, they can be loud. They can be these storms that just shake us to the core. The booms of thunder, the booms of things that happen shake us to the core in these storms of life. In other storms, they may not come with much noise, 
but rather they're quieter. And even in being quieter, they just drench us with emotions. They downpour all these emotions and we just are left soaking wet with these emotions and asking ourselves of what to do with it now. Others, they might surprise us. The bright flash of things in our lives that we have to walk through and deal with, the, the moments where we have to simply pause and, and look at what is all around us and going on and say, how do I walk and go through all of this? And the lightning appears and it reveals different things in our lives. And then there's that other storm that just comes and it dumps a whole bunch of white stuff on us and then it just disappears. And now you're left with all of these three feet of white stuff in your driveway and you're like, what do I do with it all? And I gotta move it somehow so I can keep moving forward. Storms. We in our humanity try to predict them. We in our humanity want to control them. We don't like being in the middle of them. We don't like going through them. But we know that they can change and morph as quickly and sometimes even quicker than what they've come with. And we have to morph and sometimes just ride the waves with them. Storms are unpredictable. They're unpredictable. And I think that as we're facing with this challenge now, this storm is unpredictable too. For some of us, we feel uncertain. Others of us, we feel hopeful. And others of us, we just don't know how to feel, so we just try not to feel. Storms are unpredictable. And I reflect back on this one storm of of the, a Bible story. It's a, about a boat, these few guys in a storm in the middle of the water. Now, most of us have probably heard this story before. Most of us have probably even read this story before. And this is what it says in Mark chapter 4, um, verse 35 is where I want to start. This is what it says. And later that day, after it grew dark, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. After they'd sent the crowd away, they shoved off from the shore with him as he had been teaching from the boat. And there were other boats that sailed with them. Suddenly, suddenly, as they were crossing the lake, a ferocious tempest arose of violent winds and waves that were crashing into the boat until it was all but swamped. I want to pause there. That's... 35 through 37 in those verses. And here's what's kind of going on. Remember that in these moments of this storm, Jesus is just coming back with his disciples and they're teaching. And they're about to leave this teaching that was happening and he instructs them, we are going to cross the lake. We are going to cross the lake. Let's go across the lake. And he's been talking about the Sea of Galilee here. They'll be pushing off into the Sea of Galilee and this is a sea that is surrounded by land and therefore it is known to have many violent storms. The wind can just get sucked up into that area and provide waves and storms and they create violent storms in these moments. This area is known for it. I also want to remind us that in this boat, in this boat, there are 12 disciples now, if you remember back, some of these disciples, before they were following Jesus, would have been fishermen. Which means they would have spent a good portion of their lives and time in a boat on the water. They would have grown up, they would have known and navigated storms before this. That's important here. Because I often wonder how we respond in those moments when the storm comes. But then again, I'm reminded that each day we have the opportunity to respond to the storms in lives. Especially right now. How are we navigating these storms? There's a picture that was shared with me that I want to share with you about this text. And in this picture, I, I, I find it intriguing. Because you'll look at it and you'll see some differences. 
Towards the very top, the very front of the boat, you'll see some different things of the reactions. And then look, contrast that to the people in the back of the boat where Jesus is. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Because for us, we too have navigated storms before. We've navigated how we walk and go through storms. So how are we navigating this one together? Remember, we all have emotions. God gave us emotions. He created emotions. He himself, Jesus himself, was an emotional guy. We understand that in this text, Jesus wept. We understand that in this book, Jesus rejoiced. We saw him get upset and anger come out of him. Jesus has emotions just like us. But here's the difference, and we have to remember that we cannot let our emotions drive or define us in these moments, in these storms. Our first response is to let our emotions lead the way, but rather, instead of our emotions, what if we let Jesus lead the way? What if we let him and what he says lead the way? Now, in this text, I imagine some of these, <clears throat> some of these fishermen doing the only thing they know how to do. Bail water, grab the oars, tend to the sails. They're trying to do everything in their power to essentially save their ship. But here's what's interesting to me about that. Manning the oars, bailing water, tending to the sails and redirecting them every which way as the storm and the wind changes. It doesn't stop the storm. It doesn't stop the waves from crashing over the side. In some ways, they're relying on their own understanding, their own presence, their own ideas. But if you continue to read in the story, it goes on. It says this in verse 38 through 40. I want, I want to remind you again, okay? The end of verse 37, this is what it says, okay? Violent winds and waves were crashing into the boat until it was all but swamped. But Jesus, verse 38, but Jesus was calmly sleeping in the stern, resting on a cushion. So the disciples, they shook him awake saying, teacher, don't you even care that we are all about to die? Fully awake now, he, Jesus, rebukes the storm and shouts out to the sea, hush, calm down. And all at once, all at once, the wind stopped howling and the water became perfectly calm. Then Jesus turns to his disciples and said to them, why are you afraid? Haven't you learned to trust yet? In the midst of the storm, I love this, we get a glimpse of Jesus, his humanity side. In the midst of the storm, what's Jesus doing? It says he's resting on a cushion. What strikes me is that it says Christ is resting. In some translations, it says Christ is sleeping, essentially on a pull-out sofa in the back of the boat. In the midst of a storm, Jesus is comfortable. Jesus is not worried. He's not fearful. He's not freaking out. He's resting instead. The storm is raging. The waves are crashing. The disciples screaming. But yet, but yet, Jesus is still peacefully resting. All these things, the waves, the storm, the lightning, the thunder, the howling, the waves, everything doesn't wake Jesus. The thing that disturbs him, the thing that wakes him, it was when those he loved deeply cried out for him and pleading for their safety, they wake him, they disturb him. The storms in life didn't wake Jesus. It was the people he loved deeply that awoke him and disturbed him in his heart. I wonder in this storm how often right now we might be similar to those disciples, 
trying to man the oars, bailing the water, and tending to the, the sails and thinking, if we just put it this way, everything's going to be fine. But we neglect to remind ourselves that we cannot control this storm. And then, <laughs> then Jesus gets up, arises from his slumber, his resting, and it says he rebukes the storm. This is important. He doesn't just calm the storm. He doesn't just look out and say, hey, it'd be cool if y'all just chilled out waves. Take a, take a chill pill, relax a little bit. You're kind of making these people uneasy. He doesn't look at the waves in the storm and says that. It says he rebukes the storm. That means he calls out the pain that is causing it. He takes and looks at the destruction and the chaos that it's causing and rebukes it. And in some ways, don't miss this, in some ways, this is similar to what he does when he comes across evil in his ministry. He rebukes it. He rebukes the devil as he's being tempted, right? He rebukes the, the demons. He rebukes evil in his presence. He rebukes it. He doesn't just tell it to calm down. He rebukes this. And if you are following along, if you go on to read the next chapter, the very first story that we come across is Jesus landing on the shore and going instantly and rebuking demons from a man that was torturing him in the city he lived in. Jesus goes from rebuking the water and, and those destructive forces and chaos that his disciples, the ones he loves, are enduring right now to rebuking demons that are torturing a man in the very next chapter. It's the ones he loves deeply that makes him get up and do something. Remind ourselves of this, and, and don't forget this. Christ is present in the storm, and he doesn't just calm it, he rebukes it. And I wonder right now, as we call out to him, as we sit, and maybe some of us are trying to bail the water, but maybe some of us are in the back of the boat with Jesus, calm as can be, because we're in the presence of God. And we know that he is present in the storm, and we have no fear. My question for us is, where are we in the boat? Because we have the option to be in the presence of and in the back with Jesus, knowing that he's in control. He hears us. He hears his children calling out, and he will act in the right timing. Jesus will act in the right timing. But just like the disciples, we have to trust his timing. We have to trust his heart and his plan and amidst all the things in this life. We have to trust him. What's intriguing is that the last verse, verse 41, after all this goes on, after they leave the shore and go into the boat and they're in the middle of the water and the storm comes and Jesus is taking a nap and they, they're freaking out and they wake him and he rebukes the storm and things settle down. And after he says to them, why do you fear? Have you not learned yet? This is the response. They still were overwhelmed with fear and awe. And they said to one another, Who is this man who has such authority that even the wind and the waves obey him? They just went through this storm with Jesus. He never left their side. They just saw him rebuke the storm. They just saw him literally command the wind and the waves to stand still and at his command, at his voice, it did. And it says that they still were overwhelmed with fear and emotions. And they still asked, who is this man? Even after all this happened, they still had fear and anxiety among them. Now hear me on this. I don't know what this storm right now looks like for you and your family. I know for many in the nation and in our state, 
many people have maybe even been laid off or potentially right now losing a job. I don't know what this looks like for your family as you're watching this today. I don't know what burdens you may be feeling. I don't know what hurt you may be feeling. I don't even know what emotions you may have in these moments. But here's what I do know. I do know that Jesus is still present in this boat, this ship that we are on today. And I do know and I trust that he can and he will do great things. I believe it. I might not understand it. I might not see it fully, but I know that he will do great things. I know that he is the same God that rebuked the storm and he will do it again. I know that this is the same God, the same one who provided peace to these disciples in the midst of this storm. And I know that he can do it again. I know he is the same God. I trust he is the same God. And even now, even during the midst of all of this, even after we maybe see God do miraculous things in this time, and we see God do miraculous things through this and on the other side of this virus, I believe that we may still have, for some of us, some lingering emotions and fears maybe. And here's the good news about that. He can handle them. God can handle them. I think we often try to tell ourselves that in order for us to follow Jesus passionately, we have to have this all figured out or we can't doubt or we can't struggle or we can't have fear or emotions. But the reality is this, is that he can handle them. This, this story comes in Mark chapter 4. There's many chapters after Mark 4. Jesus still does incredible things with these disciples. He still goes about and does life with them. He does amazing things with them and, and even through them after this incident. Even in the midst of this, it says that they still have fear and they still question and were overwhelmed with emotions. Jesus didn't forget them and push them off to the side. Instead, he said, keep walking with me. Keep doing life with me. I want to show you more. He's still in the business of doing that. He still revealed more things to them. He still took them and showed them his glory and his presence and his power. He did miracles and invited them into it. He showed them who he was. He not just performed miracles among them, but this is the same Jesus after the story that looked at them and said, you now go and do it. He equipped them and empowered them to go and do it, even in the midst of their emotions. He stuck with them, even when they feared, even when they were emotional, even when they didn't understand it all. He stuck with them. He's still in the boat with us through this storm. And he's going to do it for us. I believe that. I believe that he will open our hearts and our minds and our souls to see him and to see what he is doing. I fully believe that. I'm reminded of this saying that Josh shared a few weeks ago now about obedience and understanding. And this saying has, I think at least for me personally, rocked me to the core. Understanding God and his plan can wait, but obedience to it cannot. And I believe, I fully believe that right now, we don't have to understand this. We don't have to make sense of it. We don't have to try even. We just have to obey him in this. We have to obey when he says to be still to just know and trust that I am God. We have to obey and believe that he is God who can rebuke the storm. He is God that can, in the moment of his voice speaking to the storms of life, things will cease. He's the same God that can take a few loaves of 
bread and some fish and, and feed the multitudes. This is the same God that can show up to his best friend's tomb and he's dead and he can weep and then in the next moment he can cry out, come out and come to life again. This is the same God. We don't have to understand what he is doing. We don't even have to understand how he does it. We just have to obey that he is God and he is in control. Even when we don't understand and see it. Even when we might be bailing water. We might be grabbing the oars. What if we just looked back and we just decided that we're going to have peace because Jesus is at peace in this all. We're going to trust him in that. What's crazy is you can read through the word of God and you can see Jesus do incredible things. What's so incredible to me is this, is that Jesus never fails and he's been faithful. From the very first sentence in, in the word to the very last, we know and trust that God is faithful. He's done incredible things before and he's going to do it again. He's done abundantly more than we can ever expect and he's going to do it again. Acts chapter two. Disciples gather. The spirit of God pours out upon them and they see thousands added to their number daily. I wonder for us in these moments, I wonder for us if we take these opportunities to pause to be still and, and slow ourselves down to just hear God and hear his voice. That what if he's just preparing us and he's using this time right now and he's going to use this time to just show his spirit in a new way. And when his spirit pours out on us, we're going to see incredible things happen again because he's done it before. Would you trust with me that he's going to do it again?